Welcome everyone. We apologize for the short delay. We're having a few technical difficulties this morning, but we were, are going to give everyone a chance to join for another minute or so, and then we will get started. Welcome to day two of the Reconnect Post Award Workshop. Uh, thank you for your patience this morning as we are just a couple minutes behind, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for all of your questions and your great participation yesterday. We're looking forward to another great workshop today. Uh, first, we wanna go through a couple of housekeeping items. If you drag your mouse over the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a little bar pop up and on the far left hand corner, you will see the audio settings. If you are having any issues um, hearing today, you can click the little carrot and adjust your audio settings uh, there. The second functionality you will see is the chat box. Um, messages and attachments from our panelists will be dropped into the chat box today for you to view as well as links um, that are shown on the screen. The third option or the third button you will see is the Q&A button. Um, all questions will be submitted through this Q&A feature. Um, please feel free to submit at any time throughout the session and we will have time reserved at the end of each presentation to uh, get through as many as we can. The fourth button you will see is the live transcription button. If you need to turn on your closed captioning, please do so there. And finally, the fifth button you will see is the exit button. If you need to leave early or at any time throughout the session, you may click there and uh, exit the session. We'll run through the agenda today. Um, we're having a few technical difficulties this morning, so we're gonna switch some things around. We're going to start with the NEPA and section 106 review. Uh, then we'll go into the BABA and Buy American Act, um, followed up with the ACP update from the S. Uh, excuse me, the FCC, and into financial compliance. And so with that, I will turn it over to the Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Rural Utility Service Telecommunication Program, Sean Arner. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Sean Arner and I'm a Deputy Assistant Administrator here in the Telecommunications Program. I was, I've been with the telecom program for close to 31 years now, and I have to say, you know, the reconnect program is probably our biggest and most high profile program that we've had since i've been with uh, with the agency in terms of dollars and interest and in the award so you all are really to be congratulated on receiving this award and um, we're just hopeful that you know this session and working with us that you can have a successful project uh, in implementing and providing broadband to to rural america um, of course, yesterday you uh, you know you received some information on uh, both the construction procedures, the award documents, and we're today we're very, really hopeful that this session is going to be of of use to you and helpful to you as well. Um, as uh, as was mentioned, we're going to start off with the uh, the NEPA and Section 106 requirements, and then hopefully uh, then we're going to turn it over to the BABA or Build America Buy America uh, Act provisions, as well as the RUS Buy American Act. Uh, provisions, which interestingly enough, um, certain entities uh, qualify under one and certain entities have to follow the the the, uh, uh, the rules on the other. So we're going to go over that with you. And then we're going to follow that up with, as was mentioned, an uh, update from the FCC on the, the affordable connectivity program, and then some finally some uh, some financial compliance issues and, and what's required there. So uh, Welcome once again, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our team to talk about the uh, NEPA and Section 106. Thank you. Good 
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Anthony High. I'm with the Rural Utilities Service, and I will be starting the presentation for the NEPA and Section 106 for the Reconnect Round 3 and FY22 Reconnect Post Award Workshop. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, on today's agenda, um, like I said, I'm Anthony High, and I will be discussing the post-obligation completion of the Environmental and Historic Pre Preservation Review, um, agency and applicant responsibilities for fulfilling requirements of 7 CFR 1970, which is RD, Environmental Policies and Procedures, and highlight on NEPA or the National Environmental Policy Act requirements under 7 CFR 1970. And also we'll have highlights on the National Historic Preservation Act and 36 CFR Part 800 requirements presented by Glenn Stelter, uh, Russ Telecom Archaeologist. And lastly, um, environmental review amendments presented by Jim Weatherton, Environmental Protection Specialist with Russ Telecom. Next slide, please. Again, welcome everyone. Um, this is not like a comprehensive overview of 7 CFR 1970 NEPA or Section 106. Um, we're just going to be highlighting roles and responsibilities and requirements and summarizing information needs, common data gaps, and as time permits, I guess we will have questions and answers um, at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Under 1970-11B, there's a new provision which allows RD to obligate funds prior to the completion of the environmental review process. Prior to any action that would have an adverse effect on the environment or limit the choices of reasonable alternatives. Next slide, please. Awardees must comply with NEPA associated laws and authorities prior to taking an action with adverse effects or limit the choice of reasonable alternatives, which requires compliance with 46 laws and authorities. And typically the National Historic Preservation Act is the primary focus of the environmental review process due to the nature of RD projects. And also at our disposal, we have the nationwide programmatic agreement, which allows for post-obligation completion of the Section 106 process. Next slide, please. The agency must rescind obligated funds if the awardee takes an action prior to the completion of the review process that would have an adverse effect on the environment or limit choices of reasonable alternatives prior to the completion of the environmental review process, such as starting construction. Obligated funds can also be rescinded if the agency cannot conclude the review process before the end of the fiscal year after the year in which funds were obligated or proceed with their approval based on findings during the environmental review process. Next slide, please. Limitations on actions pending environmental clearance. The agency and awardee must ensure the completion of the environmental review process prior to the irreversible commitment of agency resources. The environmental review process is formally concluded when the following have occurred. Appropriate environmental review document has been reviewed for completeness. All public notices have been published and public comment periods have lapsed. All public comments received during established comment periods have been considered and addressed appropriately. Environmental review document has been approved by the agency and the appropriate environmental review de decision document has been executed by the agency. For CEs, the agency approves exhibit Ds. For EAs, the agency would issue a FONSI. And if required for the EIS or environmental impact statement, a record of decision or ROD will be issued. Next slide, please. The National Historic Preservation Act review process is formally concluded when the agency resolves potential adverse effects or issues raised by consulting participants. 
or receives concurrence on a determination of no adverse effect or no historic properties affected from state historic preservation officers or tribal historic preservation officers or other appropriate consulting parties. The memorandums of agreement are signed by signatories for adverse effect determinations to historic pro properties. Reasonable and good faith effort identifying consulting participants and providing them the opportunity to participate in the undertaking. And lastly, when the section 106 conclusion memo is signed by Russ. Next slide, please. Agency and applicant responsibility fulfilling requirements under 7 CFR 1970. Agency responsibilities include advising applicants to consider environmental issues during early project planning and not to take specific actions such as initiation of construction prior to completion of environmental review process or risk denial of financial assistance and include mitigation measures identified in the environmental review documentation as conditions in agency financial commitment documents, such as conditional commitment letters. An example of a mitigation measures includes applicants using directional boring or aerial cable on existing poles to avoid impact to wetlands and or special status species or elevating structures above the 500 year floodplain elevation and installing cabinets on existing poles to avoid any adverse impacts. Next slide, please. The agency is also responsible for all environmental decisions and findings related to its actions and outline the types of information and analysis to be included and, and independently evaluate environmental information submit, submittals required of applicants. Next slide, please. The agency is also responsible for consulting with, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. Applicant responsibilities include consulting with agency staff to determine appropriate level environmental review and obtain publicly available resources at, at the earliest possible time for guidance in identifying all relevant environmental issues and contacting state and federal agencies where appropriate to initiate consultation. Next slide, please. Applicant responsibilities also include provide information to the agency to evaluate potential impacts and alternatives of proposal. Clearly define purpose and need for the proposal. Inform agency if other agencies will be involved to ensure coordination and joint participation develop and document reasonable alternatives that meet purpose and need, prepare environmental review documents according to the format and standards provided by the agency, and as necessary, employ design or environmental professionals to assist with the preparation of environmental re review documents. Next slide, please. Applicants must also provide additional studies, data, or document revisions such as biological assessments under the Endangered Species Act, archeological surveys under the National Historic Preservation Act, wetland delineations or air quality conformity analysis as necessary. Applicants must also ensure no actions are taken that may have an adverse impact or limit the choice or reasonable alternatives during the environmental review process. Next slide, please. Applicants must promptly notify agency processing officials when changes are made so that the environmental review and documentation may be supplemented or otherwise revised as necessary and incorporate mitigation measures and required monitoring into plans and specifications and construction contracts for proposals or provide mitigation action plans. Lastly, applicants are also responsible for cooperating with the agency on achieving environmental policy goals or risk denial of the requested financial assistance. 
highlights of the National Environmental Policy Act requirements under 7 CFR 1970. What is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA? NEPA is the landmark environmental statute enacted in 1970 that established the nation's environmental policy. It demands a good faith look at environmental impacts of federal projects. Federal projects are defined as permits, approvals, direct loans, guaranteed loans, and grants. Therefore, all RD projects are subject to NEPA. And again, RD's NEPA regulations are located at 7 CFR 1970. Next slide, please. In order to expedite reviews, complete approval packages are essential, such as complete project description, map, supporting documentation, such as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Official Species List, Special Status Plant and Wildlife Species Table, Fish and Wildlife Service Concurrence Letters, SIPO, like SIPO, Initiation and Concurrence Letters, Formally Classified Lands Managing Agency Correspondence, National Wetland Inventory Maps, and FEMA Flood Maps. Specialized studies, such as archeological studies, habitat surveys, biological assessments, and wetland delineation will aid in this process. The project descriptions are the point of departure for any review. They must be complete and accurate, including project location, project description, and all project elements or components. The project description is critical for understanding what we are evaluating, such as the location, whether it's single or multiple locations, the project footprint, the act, type of activity, whether it's broadband cables, vaults, huts, new structures, new or replacement of existing fi of fiber, optic cable, construction, length, width, depth, when, when there's trenching or plowing involved, and also the setting. Predominantly RD projects are in rural areas and and identify if federally managed lands or tribal lands is involved. Staging areas, access roads, spoil storage areas, and contractors' yards. And most importantly, construction methods, whether it's horizontal drilling, open trench, plowing, aerial cable, tree clearing, trimming, time of year, whether the project is, is going to be phased and for linear projects, providing documentation to include KMZ files or shape files. Some other project description supported documentation includes, again, project location, topographic maps, and aerial or ground level photos. Maps help the agency determine the existing land use and if environmentally sensitive areas are present. Maps must clearly show the specific project locations, aerial imagery as necessary, topographic maps, and again, for linear projects, the use of KMZ or shapefile, and floodplain and wetland maps. Cat categorical exclusions under NEPA. Most reconnect projects are classified as CEs under NEPA. Proposals are subje subjected to 46 laws, authorities, and executive orders. Next slide, please. As you can see, there's a long list of special purpose laws under NEPA. Some of these statutes include the Endangered Species Act, National Historic Preservation Act, Farmland Protection Policy Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, while we're seeing Rivers Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, and Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And executive orders include floodplain management, wetland protection, and environmental justice. In order to meet the requirements for a CE, an action 
must fit within the classes of actions listed in 1970-53 or 1970-54 and involve no extraordinary circumstances re related to the proposal and not be connected to other actions with potentially significant impacts or not considered a cumulative action. Next slide, please. When determining whether CEs apply, a proposal that consists of more than one action may be categorically excluded only if all components of the proposed action are eligible for a CE. Extraordinary circumstances are unique situations presented by specific proposals such as the characteristics of the geographic area, scientific controversy about environmental effects, uncertain effects, or effects involving unique or unknown risk. Unresolved conflicts concerning alternate uses of available resources. In the event of extraordinary circumstances, a normally categorically excluded action require additional agency review to determine the potential to cause significant adverse environmental effects. If extraordinary circumstances are identified by the agency, the agency can require an environmental assessment or, or environmental impact statement. Next slide, please. For a proposal, be, proposal to be eligible for a CE, the following conditions must be ruled out. Adverse effect to historic properties, federal listed threatened endangered species or their critical habitat, or candidate species, wetlands, floodplains, formerly classified land, special sources of water, coastal barriers and coastal zone management areas and coral reefs, or contaminated sites or known public health threats, or when the action will result in a violation of a regulation or permit. Next slide, please. Raising the level of the environmental review. It can always increase, but never decrease. Environmental conditions, scientific controversy, or other characteristics unique to a special specific proposal can trigger a higher level environmental review. In such situations, the agency would determine whether extraordinary circumstances exist or the potential for significant environmental impacts warrant a higher level environmental review. Next slide. I will now turn the presentation over to Russ, telecommunications archaeologist, Glenn Stelter. Hi, everyone. Yep, uh, my name is Glenn Stelter. I'll be going over uh, the Section 106 process and the NHPA. Um, so uh, hopping in, we got four steps of the Section 106 process under 36 CFR. Uh, establish the undertaking and initiation of the Section 106 process. This is, to, to be blunt, this should not proceed in, until we officially give the go-ahead to do so. Um, this is a process that once it starts, it cannot stop. Um, identify historic properties and consulting parties. Uh, that will be that will be done as we proceed. Um, that usually include that inc always includes shippos and thippos. It can include uh, tribes, whether they're signatories or not. Uh, assess effects and provide consulting parties with assessments. Um, that's part of the 106 process. That's the evaluation. And then receive concurrence and or no objection to a finding of effect from consulting parties. That concurrence statement is is our is what we're hunting for. That's what we're always we're always out to get. Next slide, please. Uh, section 106 highlights. Proceed through the section 106 process as soon as notified to do so by an arrest staff archaeologist. That's and more often than not, that's going to be me. Um, although our, our NEPA specialists are, are more than capable of doing so. Again, once we start 106, we cannot stop. So do not start it until we say so. Um, may be required to provide additional archaeological studies. Those are, are typically called class ones or desktop studies. You'll hear both words used. They are reviews of the local history of your project and the archeo archaeological concerns. And they have to be compiled by an SOI qualified archaeologist, Secretary of Interior standard archaeologist. Um, every SHPO in every state has lists of proof firms, uh, cultural resource management firms that can that can uh, do this. And then Section 106 must be concluded prior to executing construction contracts and starting construction contracts. That is 
uh, we you need to you need to hear from us that we are finished with 106 before we start building. Information needs for defining the undertaking, and determining the area of potential effect. Throughout the whole thing, uh, if you have meetings with me or or your CRM firm, if you end up hiring one, you're going to hear APE, the APE, area of potential effects. That that is the defined project area. Um, that's that's where the shape files, where we're going to need project information, CAMs. These are shape files, detailed maps, and information about federal, uh, state, and tribal lands. Now you're going to have your your APE where you're building directly. But then there may be a wider area where we're researching. So you'll have your APE could be a 50, a 50 foot corridor. That's where the potential effects occur, area of potential effects. But when we're doing the class one, you might have a mile buffer on either side. That does not mean you're gonna have to survey or do 106 for the entire mile. That means you are doing that your class one is doing research, including things within that mile. Um, a detailed description of the activities. You know, the primary thing we are worried about is is, is um, uh, below ground disturbance, although above ground can occur uh, for visual impacts, but more often than not, our concerns are going to arise in regards to 106 when you are trenching or boring. Um, and then archaeological literature, again, there's that, that statement. Um, should be Secretary of Interior Standard qualified. Any CRM firm should have uh, have uh, SOI qualified archaeologists on staff. Otherwise, I don't know how they're doing what they're doing. But um, in every state, Chippo has a, in a list of, of CRMs that they they uh, they prefer. Next slide, please. Additional information that may be needed to define the AP. Um, literature review, class one desktop survey, as we mentioned. Um, yeah, don't don't. You could, I would recommend not putting one of these together unless we specifically directed to do so. Although some awardees choose to do so based on their prior experiences in that state. If they know that their SHPO is going to require it, you know, they, some of our awardees have proceeded to do so. But I would not, I would not uh, contract out a literature review unless we're directed by us. Um, involve me in that process. It's good to know. You may need to draft your, your literature review based on not just SHPO standards, but a particular tribal standards in your state, depending on where you are. So it's good to talk to me about how you're putting it together before you do, or an archaeologist with less. Um, and again, SOI qualified archaeologist. Next slide, please. Um, starting construction before conclusion, uh, you know, don't do that. Um, it can result in foreclosure. Uh, it, it, it's considered foreclosure of, of consultation on the advisory council and state historic preservation officers and the tribe's ability to comment, which can lead to all manner of, of troubles. That includes anticipatory demolition determination under 110. If if you go, if a person says, well, maybe, maybe if we just bulldoze this area before we get federal funds, then we won't have to do 106 out there. That is anticipatory demolition. Also not allowed. And it limits our ability to fund your projects. If if we don't go through the process appropriately. Next slide. Uh, delegation of authority. So yeah, we issue a blanket delegation of authority uh, to our applicants or awardees uh, to initiate and proceed through section 106 to a recommended finding of no historic properties. So your consultant um, or somebody on staff, if you if you have somebody internal, is going to recommend, is going to compile the information and make a recommendation of determination of effect. The agency, me, we make a determination and then we proceed through consultation with SHPO on that determination. Um, so we, we delegate authority for, for the awardees to proceed through this, but all of the ma major milestones, the sort of key points still rest within the agency's uh, responsibility by law um, as we're required to do. Um, you can reach out to state historic preservation offices. You can reach out to tribes, uh, unless a tribe specifically requests government to government consultation, either prior to the project or, dur or uh, during the initial uh, contact. There are some states as well that prefer to consult with the agency and not our awardees. Um, that is at SHPO's discretion. Um, yes, section 106 review proceeds under this delegated authority solely on the basis of an agreement between us, between all of us. Again, if at any point one of these parties says, no, we want to talk with the agency, 
I'll take over. Uh, and it does not empower you guys to make decisions regarding 106. It just empowers the awardee to compile information to proceed through parts of the uh, of the process. But I will be involved, me or another Russ archaeologist, the whole way. Next slide. There's that. If at any point a SHPO, a THIPO, or any other state federal agency requests government to government consultation, the agency will take over. We have a few states. We have a few tribes and nations that we know um, uh, require government to government consultation. So if you find yourself consulting with the Cherokee, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Nez Perce, or the Osage Nation, um, you they will they will request government to government consultation. Um, there are some states that at times want uh, government to government. And you may run into an agency, a BLM office or a forest service that would rather talk to another agency about what's going on. Um, an applicant is authorized by the agency to begin section 106 review with CHIPO, Indian tribes and other, others as appropriate. Again, we empower you to do, to do so and, and proceed through 106 with me along with the or Russ archeologist along to help and, and reach a recommended finding of no historic properties affected or no adverse. I can say 90% of the time it's going to be no adverse. No historic properties affected is a, is a, is a much harder determination to reach that's saying there's nothing there to at all affect, which is not all that common. No adverse effect is more likely, meaning there may be history there, there may be archaeology there, but what we are doing does not has no adverse effect to it. What we do not authorize y'all, uh, the awardees or applicants to do is, uh, um, if if any if any participant in the process says there may be an adverse effect, we will take over. If an if a if a, a tribe or a nation or other uh, indigenous groups um, request government to government, we will take over. Um, if there's a request to withhold information, um, certain entities, whether they be um, tribal entities. Or uh, other, or even some religious uh, institutions across the United States may have information that is about the importance of a location that they are not necessarily comfortable sharing. Um, that uh, that entity might might request that um, they talk to the agency about it and only us, or they may just say, "Please don't build there," and we're not going to explain why. Um, we are not legally we have, we don't have the authority to force them to tell us what what it is. Um, we respect their their uh, sacred beliefs, so. Um, and if there's any disagreement between the participants in the Section 106 review, um, so if anybody we're talking to says this is not being done appropriately by the law, um, I will take over and then the awardee's uh, uh, delegation uh, ends. Uh, continue. An objection filed, same thing. If, if somebody objects to it, I'll step in. Um, and if 106 has not been appropriately followed or any participant demands that the applicant take action which exceeds the requirements of Section 106 review, such as payment of fees. Um, if that starts happening, if, you, if somebody starts demanding you pay them, based on 106, let us know. Um, we, will, we will handle that. Uh, though we have authorized, issued a blanket delegation to our awardees and our applicants to initiate, to a recommended finding, do not initiate 106 consultation until we say to do so. We put this in here three times because it's very important. Don't, don't do 106, don't start the 106 until we say, go ahead. Uh, and that's it. And next, I think we have James Weatherington. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Weatherington. I am one of the environmental protection specialists here for us, and I'll be covering uh, environmental review amendments. Um, these are when you send in to us, uh, you want to amend a route, you want to amend um, a method that you're using to construct, those type of things. Um, that's when we have to possibly do a, a review of the amendment itself. Um, the request so, uh, so that we can look at uh, what our environmental review says and make sure that we've covered it or 
fill in the blanks that are going to be um, made by that uh, amendment. Um, despite the completion of environmental review for the project prior to the amendment, an additional review must be completed for any changes to ensure that any extraordinary circumstances caused by the changes are accounted for. Uh, some form of this process is required for any amendments, regardless of the level of um, documentation of the original application. Um, you're going to have a request letter. Um, it should be a brief description of the original project, the purpose and need of the changes, detailed description of the amendment, um, and or the installation, uh, let's see, um, costs, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and it needs to go to the general field representative and forwarded as required. More than likely, that's going to be forwarded to PMRA. Um, and that's how that will the process will get moving from there. Next slide, please. You need to make sure that um, when you're forwarding that letter that you have uh, KMZ or zip shape files for the route, photos of the location if required, drawing specifications for the structures, if there's going to be any new structures, um, and figures if required. Any other information that may clarify methods, process, or locations of the amendment. Those are important to, to include in there because the better and clearer this information is, the less complicated the environmental review process will be. Um, Chippo and Tippo correspondence. If consultation was previously initiated, Notification of amendments and changes must be given. Uh, Russ must provide with all documentation and assist with uh, development of any correspondence with the SHIPPOs or TIPOs as it pertains to the amendment environmental review. When these letters are sent, Russ needs to be copied on this correspondence just uh, per normal. Next slide, please. The official species list. Um, if the information planning and, and consultation IPAC official species list is greater than 90 days old uh, from when it was last processed, we need a new one. Uh, the species must be uh, rerun to check uh, for changes in the list is basically what we're doing. And if there is changes, we're going to need a, a, a new table to um, accompany those. As previously stated, some form of this process is required for any amendments, regardless of the level of environmental documentation of the original application. Please keep in mind that no matter how remote the environmental review documents that were initially issued can change as a result of, of amendments. This means that you can go from one level of categorical exclusion to another or even up to an environmental assessment. This is not usual, but it can happen. Route changes refer to change in geographic location of telecommunication infrastructure within utility corridors. That's what we have the majority of is you're you were going down one road and you want to change it up and go down another or you um, or you want to change it and go aerial down that same road instead of buried or vice versa. Scope change refers to an agreed upon change in the scope of a project typically taking place in the execution phase of a project. It can uh, relate to budget, um, adding or removing certain parts of a project and more. Um, these are our online resources for that. And I believe the next slide will be Q&A slide. And this will be Q&A from uh, all three of us. If you have any questions on any of this stuff that we've covered here, please uh, let us know. Great. Thank you, James. Um, this is Alexa. I will be your moderator today. Um, so as James mentioned, if you have any questions for James, Anthony, or Glenn on any of the items that they covered during this session, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Um, we do not have any questions in quite yet, but I'll give everybody a few minutes to do that. And while we wait, I just wanted to point everybody to the chat box. Um, I have posted the presentations for today's sessions for all of the sessions today. We had a few folks requesting to um, get those a little bit early for today. So I did put those in the chat. Um, I also had a few folks asking for the handouts from yesterday's sessions. So those are also in the chat along with the links 
um, that James mentioned on the last slide. Those are all copied into the chat. So if you need any of those documents that um, we've covered, those are in the chat for you. Um, I also want to mention if you joined us a little bit late, um, we had some technical difficulties to begin today. So we um, switched our NEPA Section 106 presentation and the BABA and Buy American presentation. So we will be going into BABA after our next break. Um, so just wanted y'all to know about that quick change for today. Okay, we do have a question in the chat that we'll go ahead and get to. The first question is, what time frame do you estimate for a route change or change of scope to be processed? Um, uh, that's a tough one. Um, this is Glenn with uh, 106. From from 106 perspective, it really depends on on if the effect is is if the proposed route change is an increase of effects, as it were. Um, if you're going from aerial to buried, that can increase what we needs to be done with 106 and how we need to reconsult. And there's always the chance that you run into something out in the field. Uh, if, or if, if a site is found or if some history is found, that can slow it down. If you're going from you know, buried to aerial, a lessening of effects, as it were, uh, more than likely it's not going to take all that long. In some cases, depending on, on the nature of your change, like if you're going to aerial with no pole replacement, strictly line only, uh, we might not even uh, reinitiate consultation on that activity. So it, it, unfortunately with 106, it, it always, it, the word is, like any, any lawyer really is, it depends on the project. All right, thank you, Glenn. Uh, thanks, Glenn. For the, um, for the NEPA side of that, once, um, so the request gets put in, um, as far as I understand the process goes through your GFR first, then he'll probably direct you to, to go to P, uh, PMRA or they'll assist you in getting it to PMRA. Um, they will process that request, and that request gets sent to our office to do the environmental um, amendment review. Uh, once we do that, that 106 will start there if it needs to, all of that. So we'll say it could take, you know, a week maybe or whatever. It could take longer. I'm not sure of their, that initial timeline. Once we get it in our office, if we have all the information that we need, and don't need to request anymore, we can start some of that processing very quickly. Again, um, 106 sometimes takes time. Uh, if all of a sudden you're going through an area that may require additional Section 7 biological resource um, review, or all of a sudden now re uh, requires informal consultation with Fish and Wildlife, um, something to that effect, it can take longer. I mean, it, it's a, the problem is what Glenn, Glenn said is very true. It really depends. I would say that we try to keep it within um, a month or so, but we also, you have to understand that your project is normally not the only one we have. Um, Glenn does 106 for the entire United States, and Anthony and I have basically split it in half. So we have many projects and many amendments, and not just reconnect, we do other, um, other loans and stuff as well. Sometimes it can take a minute to get through them. But we do try, we don't drag our feet and we try to get information as quickly as possible. So if we request information, please try to get it to us as soon as possible. And that goes for whether it's an amendment or whether it's a, you know, the original project. We're, um, we're asking for that because we need it for the review in order to move this forward as quickly as practical. All right, thank you. Next question, for use of existing towers where the awardee is leasing space on the facility, must NEPA information be sent to USDA? Can you repeat that question again, please? Sure. 
For use of existing towers where the awardee is leasing space on the facility, must NEPA information be sent to USDA? Yes, we still have our own process. Even if it's, for instance, let's say you're using, uh, you have a microwave tower and you're all of a sudden, you, you, you have a lease through um, FCC. FCC um, has to do the section 106 for that tower use. Um, and then we just get a letter. Uh, when you get the letter saying that you're good to go, you just forward it to us for our records. If you are co-locating, that is still a process and that's going to be, um, you're going to be doing an environmental report because that will be a um, dot five four categorical exclusion. And uh, so we're gonna need all of that, that, that entailed as well. So we still have to go through the process, even if you're co-located. Okay, thank you, James. The next question, how do you determine when a project needs full 106 review? Much of the information asked for is similar to what is asked for in the environmental section of the application, but it sounds like some projects are selected for a more involved 106 review. Why? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, that is, that is largely the job, uh, my job as an archeologist is to, is to assess the project and the location, uh, the activities in the location and, and determine uh, the level of 106. Um, it, usually it's, it's based on location. So often we have in our studies, in those desktop studies or class ones that I was, that I was referencing before, um, we might have probability maps attached to those, or we might request those. So that is a that is a thing that an archaeologist or firm can put together. Uh, basically, assessing the probability of finding a site and location. Often, it's proximity to water, uh, whether now or or, or prehistoric water or, or extant waterways, um, slope things like that. There are other other uh, reasons. It it could be simply the activity, uh, the nature of the landscape. If you're Building alongside I five, you know, you're in a right of way, and you're alongside I five. That the level of disturbance is really high. If your right of way is a two track, is a was a you know two track twenty years ago, it's a county road in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we don't know what's there. Um, so there, there's multiple things: existing no, known data, the location on the environment, the expressed interests of tribes in that area, in the location that they maybe have told us and and nobody else, or Chippo, or or some other entity. Um, it's it's it, there's no one uh, determining factor for whether or not uh, a project will require 106 or not. It's a it's a it's a sum whole. Okay, thanks, Glenn. That's the last question that we had in the Q and A right now. I'll give it a few more minutes for folks to put in some more questions. Okay, it looks like we're going to wrap up a little bit early. Um, thank you, Glenn, Anthony, and James for presenting on NEPA and Section 106. I will turn it back over to Val before we go to our break. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, at this time, we are going to break. And since we are done a little early, um, we will come back at half past the hour, so um, 2.30 Eastern. Uh, 130 Central. Um, so we will see you then. Thank you.
All right, welcome back to day two, um, session number two of the Reconnect Post Award Workshop. Um, if you joined us right away this morning, uh, you know, we had a couple technical difficulties, so we ended up um, revising a couple of the sections. We went over the NEPA and Section 106 uh, information first, and now we will go into the BABA and Buy American uh, requirements. And so with that, I will turn it over to Aileen Mathness to get us started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? We can. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to make sure. Okay. Um, um, my name is uh, Eileen uh, Mafnes. I'm the uh, engineering branch chief of the uh, policy and outreach division of the uh, Rural Utility Service telecommunications program. Um, thank you everyone for joining this uh, webinar about the uh, domestic uh, procurement preference applicable to all RUS funded project by the uh, telecommunications program. So especially the uh, Reconnect project that is the most popular project from uh, RUS uh, telecom. Today, I will discuss both the uh, long-standing uh, Rural Utility Service by American requirement under 7 CFR 1787 and the new Build America by America requirement that was uh, established in 2021 under the uh, Infrastructure Investment and uh, Job Act. So now let's begin with the uh, RUS by American requirement under 7 CFR 1787. Next slide, please. The um, domestic procurement preference is not something new to RUS. Uh, this provision uh, started with RUS from the uh, Rural Electrification Act of 1936. And this was like during the uh, Great Depression where the unemployment rate was high and people needed jobs. So this provision helped create the jobs and put people to work. So at that time, uh, we have the uh, RUS Bulletin, which was started or we have it um, published in July 28, 1955. So we finally have it codified in November 27, 2018 as 7 CFR 1787. So we've been using it for 63 years. Actually, that is the quickest um, uh, regulation that we have codified in 2018. And then also the, during the pandemic, we have concerns, you know, about the uh, workforce, the uh, domestic uh, manufacturing, and also the supply chain. And this was evident uh, during pandemic where we cannot even get face masks here in our own nation. So this led for our uh, government, uh, you know, uh, leaders to have the uh, Build America, Buy America requirements that set forth in the uh, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act of 2021, which will I discuss further more during my presentation. Now, let's discuss further the uh, 7 CFR 1787. Next slide, please. Okay. So the uh, 7 CFR 1787, the uh, categories of products that was covered here will include that um, the uh, materials and uh, supplies and, and manufactured uh, articles are mined or produced 
in the United States or on the uh, eligible countries. So this uh, manufactured project, product produced in the United States or on eligible countries must at least have 50% of the value of the components part were manufactured in eligible countries. And this eligible countries is, um, is um, determined by the US trade uh, representative. Uh, next slide. So on uh, 7 CFR 1787, those are the um, section where we will have the uh, countries that, um, that was specified, that was designated by the uh, U.S. Trade Representative. And you can fully access and get those lists of countries from the uh, link that I have uh, in this uh, slide presentation, that's it's in blue. So uh, we have about at least 11 uh, countries that was uh, determined by the U.S. Trade Representative as uh, our U.S. Uh, eligible countries, which will be on the uh, next slide. So these are the uh, list of eligible countries which is um, Canada, Taipei or Taiwan, European Union, Hong Kong, Iceland, Israel, Japan, uh, Liechtenstein, Mexico, Norway, and Singapore. And uh, recently I've been receiving a lot of inquiries about South Korea, and I would just like to let everyone know that South Korea is not on the list of eligible countries. Even though this list was uh, reflect in 2014, until now we do not have any updated list. So hopefully we're going to have it. Then once we have it, we will publish it on the federal register. Next slide, please. Now there are three ways where you can uh, request for the uh, Buy American waiver. So these are the uh, 1787, that 11, which is the uh, cost differential, the 1787, that 12, which is the uh, non-availability or shortages, and lastly, is the 1787.13, which is for public interest or practicality. So all of this is also outlined on the uh, 7 CFR 1787. And also when, whenever you um, request for the uh, waiver, um, you will have to demonstrate that um, the supporting statement that we will need, like for example, on the uh, cost differential, this is uh, the cost between the non-domestic and domestic product is unreasonable. And also the domestic product must provide at least 6% or more price reduction below the lowest domestic price found. And the awardee must also show diligence in seeking a domestic uh, manufacturer of functionality equivalent uh, equipment. Typically, multiple competitive price quotation uh, showing the uh, cost differentials. And then when you are requesting for a waiver, um, for the uh, cost uh, differential. If you can please go to the previous slide. Thank you. Uh, we will need a, um, or the uh, awardee must uh, demonstrate their due diligence. And then um, we will need your, um, we will need the quotations 
or the uh, beads or, or quotations from uh, multiple domestic sources to be on the vendor letterhead. It should be provided. And then there can be like three recent quotation, which is typically uh, sufficient for us. And this will be coming from multiple vendors that make sure you support that those products are non in existence or their pricing uh, should show the uh, 6% uh, uh, less reduction from the lowest domestic price. So when we're seeking this, uh, this will uh, help us to make sure that uh, we did our due diligence and uh, we will be able to continue to process your request for the uh, waiver for using the uh, non-domestic product. Next slide, please. Now, the other, the next uh, waiver that you can, or that the awardee or borrower can request is the uh, non-availability or shortages. So this means that there is a non of that the product is not available domestically. So awardee must present documentation in the form of quotation of delivery or lead times for the non-domestic supplier and multiple uh, domestic supplier. So to qualify under this provision, there must be a shortage of domestic product of uh, sufficient quantity or quality, wherein uh, the lack of domestic alternative should will jeopardize the completion of the project or it will cause hardship and then it's not going to be here in a timely manner and this is pretty evident on those states that has a uh, short uh, construction period so we will need you to uh, give us a uh, sufficient uh, supporting documentation to uh, support these uh, waiver uh, request. Next slide, please. So the third uh, waiver that we will be able to uh, grant to the awardee or borrower is the uh, 7 CFR 1787.13, which is the public interest or uh, practicality. So the awardee must show how uh, Incorporating a domestic product will be inconsistent with the public interest or how impractical it will be to integrate into the system where a non-domestic product will not be. So because of the public interest is generally more difficult to gauge, it is especially important that the ORD will provide a clear justification for the waiver claim. Specifics of a system incompatibility must be presented in writing and with their systems design that will help us to illustrate any uh, compatibility issues. So in here, we also um, need a detailed explanation supporting this request. Next slide. We also need you to uh, make sure that those products, especially the uh, non-domestic ones, must meet the uh, technical standards of our US, especially with our fiber cables, the uh, P90, and then the uh, P91, and then the other various uh, equipment standards that we have under CFR 1755. Uh, so regardless of the sourcing of the uh, project material, they must meet the RUS uh, standards and uh, specifications. Next slide. Some uh, important details. So the waiver must be in hand for an RUS of awardee 
to use the federal funds to purchase non-domestic product because a contract to purchase is between the awardee and the vendor. So if the waiver request is not approved, the awardee will be required to use its own funds for the purchase. So this is why a waiver approval is required before an awardee signs the contract with the supplier. And at the same time, all awardees, contractors, and suppliers should be aware of the uh, McCain Act, which is the extension of the National Defense Act authorization of 2019 that have been incorporated in the uh, Code of Federal Regulations, which prohibits the purchase of telecommunications equipment from uh, or none of the content of this telephone equipment was be, must be produced by product by Huawei or ZTE or any of their subsidiaries or affiliates. So we will need a sworn statement of compliance with this requirement, and this should be submitted to RUS, and this statement will be coming from the manufacturers of the uh, non-domestic equipment. Next slide. Now I'm going to the uh, next, uh, or the, the, uh, the uh, RUS Buy American Requirements, which is the uh, IIJA uh, Build America Buy America Act, uh, which was uh, enact enacted in the uh, 2021 under the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, so um, which is now what we call uh, BABA, which uh, the BABA and the uh, RUS uh, 7 CFR 1787 pretty much have, uh, have uh, similarities. And later on, I will show it to you guys uh, what is the difference or the comparison uh, between the two. So the uh, Build America by America Act was um, was um, was introduced in 2021 to uh, strengthen the uh, Made in America law and also to uh, uh, bolster the America's industrial base and also to protect national security and at the same time to uh, support the uh, high paying jobs here in our nation. Uh, next slide. So what is Build America by America Act? So the uh, RUS grant loan and loan guarantee application in the telecommunication program will be evaluated and determine whether first, are you a non-federal entity? Second, is the project that will be funded is an infrastructure project? And third, Will that activity be defined as project activity? So during the uh, award process or on the uh, offer process, all awardee will be required to uh, submit a determination or an evaluation and a determination form. So the uh, Build America, Buy America Act project evaluation form, uh, they will ask there, it's like a check mark. You're gonna say, are you a non-federal entity? Yes or no. Or if it is an infrastructure project, or if that project is a project activity. Now, if you check that you are a non-federal entity, then you will have to comply with the uh, Build America, Buy America Act. So what is the definition of the bill of non-federal entity? 
Next slide. So the non-federal entities is defined in 2 CFR 200 as state, local government, Indian tribe, institution of higher education, or nonprofit organization that carries out a federal award as a recipient or sub-recipient. Here, some nonprofits are also considered to be those organizations that act in the uh, broad uh, public interest without regard to a financial uh, return, such as the um, telephone and uh, electric cooperative, generally fall outside the uh, nonprofit classification because they operate to pass on those uh, financial savings to its members. So therefore, the electric and telephone cooperatives are generally will not fall under the BABA requirements, but will fall under the RUS by requirement 7 CFR 1787. Now, what are the different infrastructure that was defined here? What we have with, it is an infrastructure, if it is a road, highway and bridges construction, if it is a public transportation, if it is a construction for dams, ports, harbor, and other maritime facilities. And it's all outlined here, but the most important one that we need is right there, the very last one, it says broadband infrastructure. So broadband is considered an infrastructure. And then what is a project activity? Project activity is a construction, alteration, maintenance, or repair of infrastructure in the United States. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned before, the uh, 7 CFR 1787 RUS Buy American requirement has three, uh, three things where you can apply for a waiver. So as with the BABA, it's, you can also apply for a waiver to use a non-domestic product, but there is a difference. Let's say for the 7 CFR 1787, we only require 6%, but for BABA, it requires 25% to grant the waiver. Then next on the uh, component content for uh, 7 CFR 1787, we require 50%. With BABA, it's 55%. And at the same time, with BABA, they also require more transparency. So now we are required to post the uh, waiver request at the uh, Made in America office, at the Office of Budget and Management for 15 days. So if anybody made a comment while you're applying for your waiver and say, hey, I can produce that uh, product, then most likely that particular waiver that you requested will not get approved because somebody made a comment that he will be able to supply it and, and get it manufactured. So it, it's different with the BABA and uh, also we, they also require, when you uh, apply for BABA, they require a market research. Now, how extensive the market research will be, I don't have that at this time because so far right now, I have not processed any uh, BABA waiver, but since I've been on the, uh, group meetings with the other agencies, wherein there was one agency that shared with us about their uh, 
waiver that they have that being requested for the uh, uh, electric vehicle charger. Oh, it's very extensive on what they have. Imagine they even have economists that prepare their market research. So how extensive will the market research be? Uh, we'll find out once we start processing and what will be the OMB's uh, requirement on how can we demonstrate on those um, uh, justification down the road. Next slide. So starting from our reconnect round three of uh, non-federal awardees or non-federal entities awardees, will be subject to Build America, Buy America Act, which means those projects were obligated after May 14, 2022, so they have to comply with the Build America, Buy America Act. So, so far on our round one, we have about at least 10 non-federal entities. On round two, we have about four, non-federal entities that will be recorded. And then now on round three, we have about seven non-federal entities that will require to comply with Build America, Buy America Act. Now, does it mean that other RUS awardees not subject to Buy American requirement? No. All other awardees will be subject to RUS existing Buy American requirements, which is codified in 2018, which is 7 CFR Part 1787. So no matter what, we have to comply with the Buy American requirement. Next slide. As I mentioned before, the uh, Build America, Buy America Act, they have that the waiver may be also be requested, number one, for non-availability, and then number two, for unreasonable costs, but the only difference is they ask for 25% overall uh, cost, uh, uh, like a 25% difference for them to uh, grant the unreasonable cost. And also the last one is also the uh, public interest. So it's pretty much uh, similar with the uh, 1787. But of course, with BABA, you are required to have it published for 15 days with uh, OMB. Next slide. So now understand that the waiver process entails and um, your waiver process will be reviewed in, the, in our US and also on the uh, USDA department level. And then of course the uh, OMB will review it too. And then it will be posted for uh, 15 days for public comments. Then right after we receive those public comments, then uh, RUS will have to prepare our uh, response. And then we have to submit that to uh, OMB until uh, then once it gets submitted to OMB for their concurrence on whatever we have, uh, whatever response that we have for those uh, comments that we receive. Then they will return it back to us. Then after it got returned to us, then we will have to uh, get it, uh, have the uh, USDA uh, Secretary's Office grant and approve the, uh, the waiver. Uh, next slide. Now, if you um, 
So those uh, information specific to the materials, uh, manufactured products or construction. So most of those items, description, and uh, we have some more information on the website, on the uh, uh, USDA uh, Buy America waiver for federal financial assistance. And in this uh, website, it was posted the um, customer, uh, customer packet. And then here we also have the uh, form that you will need to uh, submit to RUS if you need to apply for the uh, Build America, Buy America waiver. And the form that we have or that you will need to uh, fill out is uh, optional form 2021. So on that uh, detailed uh, form, you will have to check mark uh, the type of waiver, whether it's uh, non-availability, unreasonable cost, or is it for public interest? And you're supposed to include the recipient name, the unique identifier, and then you also need to uh, have the um, list of material that you are applying for the, uh, for the waiver and make sure you have the product and uh, service code plus their NICS code, which is the uh, National American Industry uh, Classification Code. It should be included. And also a uh, statement of the uh, waiver justification, which is to include uh, the efforts that also made like the market research or your outreach on the industry. So those are the supporting documentation that you will need to uh, submit to uh, USDA when you apply for the, uh, for the waiver. Uh, next slide. And uh, we also have a waiver that was um, approved in uh, September 13, 2022. And this is for the uh, de, minimis, uh, wave, uh, de minimis and uh, small grants and uh, minor components. And this, uh, the detail for this uh, waiver can be uh, accessed to the link uh, uh, provided. And then that will show you that the, um, the um, the de minimis uh, um, waiver that we have, and then uh, this waiver is good for five years. So after five years, RUS or USDA will have to reevaluate whether that particular um, waiver will still be applicable to uh, to RUS, or will, if they need to increase it, or if there will be any changes. So the de minimis waiver will allow projects to include non-domestic product as long as their total value is less than 5% of the project cost and does not exceed a million dollars. Now, the, also the federal simplified acquisition threshold that is exempt for projects of less than 250,000 is considered as a uh, small grant. Now, the third class, which is minor component, this is mostly applicable to the iron and uh, steel. So this is not primarily for uh, telecom equipment. So this is uh, most specifically for like uh, the uh, special bolts or, or uh, assembly for the um, for the um, iron and uh, steel products. Next slide. So in general, this is the uh, table or a summary that uh, uh, reflect the difference between the uh, 7 CFR 1787 RUS Buy American Requirement and the uh, Build America, Buy America Act. So let's say for the uh, 7 CFR 1787, 
The cost deferential is 6%. Now with BABA, it's 25%. Now on the uh, domestic content calculation, on CFR, 7 CFR 1787, it's uh, 50% to grant the waivers. Now with BABA, it's uh, 55%. With the iron and steel, with 7 CFR, we do not have that requirement, but with BABA, they do have a requirement that needs to be considered on iron and steel. But with the telecom program, we don't usually have this. But last, last but not the least, is the public disclosure for transparency. With 7 CFR 1787, we do not have a requirement for it to be published but with BABA, it's required to be published for 15 days. Now, decision will rest with RUS whether to reject or to grant the waiver. Now, when it comes to uh, eligible countries where will RUS considered uh, eligible countries with BABA? Yes, RUS can consider that. There is no, um, no, uh, we are not going to have any violation if we're going to uh, consider the uh, eligible countries that we have that was established in the 1787. And uh, next slide. Okay, so that uh, concludes my presentation. So now um, I'm open for uh, questions and answers. Hello, everyone. This is Ken with the Technical Assistance Branch. Eileen, thank you very much for all that information. We have one question in the queue right now. The question is, are FY22, fiscal year 22, congressionally directed spending awardees subject to Buy American Requirements, or IIJABABA? -A -A. If the award is obligated after May 14, 2022, it will be required to comply with Build America, Buy America Act. Okay, thank you very much for that. That is currently the, oh, we just got one that popped in. The question is, you covered waivers thoroughly. However, what are the, quote, forms or other items needed from vendors or awardees to approve Buy America rules and regulations? Uh, can you repeat that again, Ken? Because I'm not sure. seeing the uh, questions right now on the uh, on the chat because I have some technical difficulties. So I'm not, just not a just problem. Participating by phone. Okay. Not a problem. I'll read that again. It says you covered waivers thoroughly. However, what are the forms or other items needed from vendors or awardees to prove Buy America rules and regulations? Okay, so that will be the uh, the other items that will be needed from vendors or awardees to prove the uh, Buy American rules and regulations. Then they have to make sure it was produced in the United States. So if the vendor says, oh, no, it's made in China. So definitely it's not going to uh, meet the Buy American requirement. Or if you are listed on the eligible countries that I mentioned a while ago, which is uh, Japan and uh, that has a trade agreement with, uh, with the U.S., then we will consider it to, to meet the uh, Build America, Buy America requirement. 
call. Thank you very much. There are no other questions. We will hold for a couple of moments to see if another question comes in. And while we wait to see, I have also entered into the text box, the link for the contact us inquiry uh, portal. If after this presentation, you think of a question for Eileen or any of our other staff for any of the topics we've covered, feel free to use that and submit your questions. Our staff will be happy to answer those as quickly as possible. Okay, well, we're not seeing anything here. Oh, hey, wait, wait, we got one just as soon as I said that. Eileen, our next question is, will a statement from the vendor be enough for proof? Uh, yes, or certification from the vendor that they are manufactured here in the United States or from those eligible countries will suffice. Okay. Thank you very much. It has uh, to be from the manufacturer, not from the supplier. Very, very important difference there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We have we have no other questions, so I will simply say again that if you think of another question, please feel free to use the contact us link. It is in the chat for everyone to see, along with the links that were noted in the presentation and a copy of the slides that Eileen used today. With that, Val, I'll pass it back to you. Eileen, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for joining us for the BABA and Buy American session. Um, our next session will start in approximately 30 minutes. So we can go ahead and break a little early at this time, and we will see you back here in about 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has stayed with us. We are going to uh, go ahead and get started on our final session here uh, of day two of the Reconnect Post Award uh, workshop series. And next we are going to um, get an ACP update from the FCC and then we will go into financial compliance. So please welcome our next speaker, Ms. Keela. Hernandez Gilola, and I may have pronounced that incorrectly, my apologies, but Gila, we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. This is uh, Kayla Hernandez Ujoa from the Federal Communications Commission. So I'm going to give a brief um, overview of the Affordable Connectivity Program. Let's see, I am going in here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me know if you cannot see it. It is showing.
Keila, I'm not sure if you're talking at this point, but we are unable to hear you. Let's see, can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Perfect. <laughs> so um, I was saying, you know, I'm going to be going through some of these slides a little quickly because I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I do want to kind of highlight some of the great things about the program. And if anyone needs a copy of the slides or additional information, they can always email acpspeakers at fcc.gov and more than happy to share information. But the way consumers can sign up for this program and if they're eligible is to go to getinternet.gov and they will see the click for the application, but there's also information on the site that's, that's really helpful. Um, another thing that a lot of consumers ask and you'll hear me talk a lot about is households. So a household is eligible for this program if they meet a lot of different requirements, and you can see some of them here on your screen. But I want to kind of pick on, on a few. Most households qualify for this program because their income is at or below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. The great thing is that you don't have to know what those numbers are off the top of your head. The application does have a section that explains what 200% of the federal poverty guidelines would be for a household based on the number of people in the household, and it'll give you what the maximum amount for yearly income is. And as long as those two requirements meet, then the household's eligible. But some consumers also qualify other ways for this program, and they only need to meet one on one criteria. So for example, if a household has someone that participates in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or is a Medicaid recipient, or Supplemental Security Income, just as examples, that household is eligible. Uh, if someone in the household has, there's a child that participates in the National School Lunch or School Breakfast Program, including Community Eligibility Provision Schools, that also qualifies the household. A Pell Grant recipient in the household qualifies the household. And those are just some of the ways that the household can qualify for this program. So some consumers also ask about tribal because the benefit is up to $30 per month for eligible households. Uh, for households qualifying on, if we have households on qualifying and federally recognized tribal lands, that benefit goes up to $75 per month. So this is a great program for uh, eligible households because we do understand that a lot of now, a lot of consumers do need access to internet or broadband. So we talked about eligibility. And we talked about just households overall. One of the things that this program has is it, and as I talk about the FCC, is we talk a lot about consumer protections for this program. So how does the ACP protect consumers? You can see on your screen that there are many ways we do it, but I think I wanna highlight one of the most important ones, and that's towards the bottom of your screen. It says, providing a dedicated FCC process for a ACP complaints. Now the FCC, we already take consumer complaints. If you go to consumercomplaints.fcc.gov um, and because we're a telecom aid, uh, regulating agency, there's lots of consumer complaints that we have, but specific to the affordable connectivity program, we have on the top of the page, a red banner that says, or asks um, if you need help with an ACP complaint. Now, understanding that a lot of consumers may not have access to this program who are currently eligible for it, what we do is we have a toll-free number and that number is 888-225-5322. And of course, consumers, it doesn't mean that if they file a complaint that the provider is doing something wrong, but sometimes it's just the consumer needs more information. So again, we have a lot of consumer protections, our page, and there's a lot of other different ways that we protect consumers. And I'll pick one, another example that a lot of consumers come to us with. So a provider cannot upsell or downsell a consumer on a plan, whether you 
are a consumer who has a plan already or you don't have one, but you're trying to explore what plan might be the best to meet your household's internet needs, a provider can't let you um, and enroll you in a more expensive or less expensive plan unless it is your choice. So that is why we let consumers know to please really explore and do research on the potential plans being offered by the provider of your choice, or if it's a provider that you already have, um, once you receive the benefits, so you could get the best plan for your household. So the, how can the FCC support your outreach efforts? Now that you know about the program, how can we, the FCC, help? Well, there's lots of ways. We have an ACP outreach toolkit that's available online. And see on your screen, there are lots of different materials in that outreach toolkit. We have social media, we have for printables, we have videos and public service announcements or PSAs. So I'll just name a few that I like to share with consumers uh, for under social media images. We have a lot of them available in our outreach toolkit. You could decide which one fits your community's needs or what your organization wants to put forward. We have fact sheets that are printable and customizable, meaning it's a Word document. If you want to add an additional logo to that fact sheet, you're definitely more than welcome to. And the fact sheet I like because it comes in other languages. So in addition to English and Spanish, it comes in about eight different languages, including languages like Haitian Creole, Vietnamese, and Portuguese, so that you can have uh, your community can get information in language. And of course, under videos and PSAs, we have a lot of videos. Um, many of them are in American Sign Languages for communities that need it. We have an overview video of the program. So just lots of re different resources. Here on your screen, you kind of see what the outreach toolkit looks like uh, as its cover. And I talked about full some of the materials you'll see here, full page flyers, social media graphics that I mentioned. There's a lot to choose from, and these are all free to download. The FCC does have limited print runs on flyers and posters, and we print up to batches of 1,000. So if you ever need something for an event that you would like to hand out, more than happy to work with you on how to obtain those materials. So how do you obtain them? You can send an email to acpinfo at fcc.gov, and in your email, please include the number of materials that you would like, which materials they are, what language, if that's applicable, include an e your address where you would like this information sent to. And of course, um, please do not include a PO box as we do not uh, and cannot deliver uh, to a PO box. Um, I mentioned before, ACP speakers at fdcc.gov is the best place if you have any questions or would like to request um, more information. We also have outreach at fcc.gov as one of the email addresses where you can also join our mailing list for additional information. We try not to bombard you with information, but it's also a good way to get updates delivered to your inbox from the FCC. We have a lot of resources I mentioned before. I'll just name a few here. ACP info at FCC.gov for more information. If you need accessible format materials, you can send an email to FCC504 at FCC.gov. And our hub for all information is FCC.gov slash ACP. But we also have outreach practices that we share. We Consider everyone to think and act local. And this is for when you're having events, you can co coordinate with your local faith-based organization, libraries, you can share social media on your website. We want you to tap into your network. Please share information with anyone that you think can have it. School principals, you know, your government officials um, in your community, anything um, that you would like to share, please, please do so. We're more than happy to help with that. We want everyone to become ambassadors for ACP and by sharing information, that's the best way of doing so. So here we're ending uh, with one of our quotes from our chairwoman, Jessica Rosenworcel, who's very much 
um, a supporter of this program throughout the agency. And it says the future belongs to those who are connected. And as Kayla, not as FCC, I totally agree with that because as I said before, a lot of people need to be connected to get things like schoolwork done, paying their bills, some places telehealth appointments. So it's important that through you, we can share this information. Um, that is it for the presentation. I am more than happy to answer questions. Awesome, thank you so much. We do have one question in the Q&A right now, so I'll give folks a minute to put more questions in, but we'll start with this first one. Can a tribal household receive both the lifeline benefit of $34.25 and the ACP benefit of $75? Yes, and thank you for that question. So, and, and this applies to both um, the tribal community and um, consumers who are eligible who are not part of the tribal community. You can, if you are eligible for Lifeline and the Affordable Connectivity Program, you can receive both. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Lifeline, it does pay $34.25 for households, eligible households on tribal lands. Um, for the general consumer, that's $9.25. Um, and you can have both benefits. If you are eligible for both, uh, the lifeline benefit would be applied first to your bill, and then it, it would be the affordable connectivity program. Okay, great. Thank you. And we do have another question. Will providers ever have the opportunity to be reimbursed for ACP outreach event expenses that we host to get individuals signed up for the program? Now, I'm thinking if, if this is related to an actual service provider, internet service provider, um, they would get reimbursed for the up to $30 per month. Um, I don't have the exact answer for you in terms of additional activities out, outside of that, but if you send your questions to ACP speakers at FCC.gov, I will definitely find the answer for you. I, you know, I don't wanna give misinformation and, um, but I do know that part. You do get reimbursed for the up to $30 per month. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one more question. Will U.S. territories receive a high cost designation for the ACP program and receive the $75 benefit? I believe that the answer to that Maybe no, but again, send send the information. Um, if if the if it is if it is federally recognized tribal lands, then yes, seventy five dollars. If it is not, probably the household would have to apply at the up to the thirty dollars per month. Awesome, thank you. And we've had a few people requesting the slides, so I will copy that email address that you've mentioned a few times so that folks can um, request a copy of the slides after today's session. Um, and that is the last question that we have in the Q&A. So thank you so much, Kayla, for joining us today. Um, we will now go ahead and move into our financial compliance session. Thank you. Yep. So welcome to the post-award financial compliance presentation for round three of the ReConnect program. I am Ryan Haymore, and I am the Midwest Accounting Branch Chief in the External Compliance Division. Our division is responsible for monitoring our U.S. awardees for financial compliance. ECD is comprised of five branches. We have one technical accounting and review branch and four field branches. Those of you who are new to borrowing or receiving grants from the telecom program will become very familiar with our field branches. We're going to be visiting your organizations and performing site visits throughout the year or throughout your award. We're gonna have a slight change here. Uh, Tim France is on vacation this week, but assisting me today will be 
Chris Kohlberg, the branch chief of the Western Region Accounting Branch. So today, our agenda, we're gonna cover compliance resources, project completion, affiliated transactions, record retention, disallowance and conditions of documents. Tomorrow, Pam Wordle, the field accountant assigned to South Dakota will, will be presenting the accounting topics important for new awardees. The first thing I want to point out are the resources that are available to help you understand the compliance requirements of your reconnect award and where you can find references to the information that I'm going to provide to you during this presentation. The first place you begin to see the requirements of the program is in the reconnect funding opportunity announcement for round three. I'm going to be referring to this document simply as the FOA. Now that awardees are going out, now that awards are going out, you will find some of the same requirements along with, our, with other compliance requirements located in your award documents, your grant agreements, loan agreements, or loan grant combination agreements. We have also posted construction procedures for the ReConnect program out on the ReConnect website. The ReConnect website is another great resource that includes sample documents or other guidance and answers to frequently asked questions. I am going to be referring to these resources throughout my presentation. You will notice that the resources I mentioned on the previous slide often refer to each other to provide additional guidance. Some examples are listed here like the FOA requires you to comply with the ReConnect program construction procedures when constructing project assets. The FOA also requires you to comply with the grant, loan, and grant loan combination agreements, and these documents provide reference to certain regulations that you must also follow. It is important to become familiar with these documents as well as the regulations they reference to avoid pitfalls and roadblocks when completing your ReConnect project. Project completion. How long do you have to complete your project once awarded? That is what we will cover next. The project must be completed within five years from the date the funds are first made available. RUS considers the first funds release date to be when they are first available. A build out of the project is considered complete when three mile, milestones are obtained. First, the network design must be fully implemented. Second, the service operations and management system infrastructure is operational and the, the awardee is ready to support the activation of individual customers to the new system. We will cover affiliated transactions next. You must have prior written consent to use an affiliate on the project. Any cost incurred are limited to the lower of cost or market and will be subject to verification of RUS. Our field accountants will look at the books and records of any affiliate you are using. If we are prevented in any way, the entire cost will be disallowed. Here's the definition of an affiliate included in your award documents. It's pretty broad and intends to be all encompassing. Some things we have seen in the past are husband and wife have different companies and they insist that they are not affiliated, but I assure you that they are and we will treat them as such. We have also seen people claim that companies are unrelated, yet the owner of one company is the same owner of the other company through multiple layers of holding companies. Again, they are related and they will be treated as such. Remember, you must have prior written permission. So if you try to hide it and it's uncovered later, no matter if the costs were fair, they will be disallowed. Again, here's another reference of an affiliated party transaction. Hopefully you have gotten the point by now. A key point to remember is that neither you nor any of your affiliates are allowed to profit in the project build out. You earn your profits later when selling the broadband services. 
Next, I will discuss the accounting requirements for construction of reconnect project assets by affiliates. It is important that affiliates keep cost support as if they were building the assets for their own use. The affiliate should review and use REA Bulletin 1770-1 to develop a proper work order system. The cost of affiliated party construction that RUS will finance is divided among three categories, labor, material, and overheads. We will go over each of these categories in the next few slides along with restrictions for each. RUS will only finance the labor that is directly associated with the construction of the reconnect project assets. Financing will be limited to the amounts paid to laborers building the asset, in-house engineers only if in-house engineering was approved by RUS, and direct supervision of the construction by first-line supervision. What we mean by first-line supervision is the supervisor working in the field with the crew. RUS will not finance salaries of executives or senior level supervisors of the affiliate, regardless of their role, unless negotiated and approved in writing by RUS in advance of construction starting. Labor rates must be supported by proper payroll records. Proper records would be contemporaneous timesheets that account for all hours, dates, descriptions of work performed and work order or accounts time was charged to. Labor rates paid to employees working on reconnect projects should be the employee's normal rate. That is, the rate should not be marked up just because the employee is working on the reconnect project. RUS will only finance the actual cost of materials used to construct reconnect project assets. There are a couple of different ways materials can be assigned to the reconnect project. Material can be directly purchased for the project, in which case material charges would be supported by vendor invoices and material issuance tickets. Material can also be charged out of inventory and used on the reconnect project. In this case, the actual cost would be supported by the perpetual inventory average unit cost in turn supported by vendor invoices and material issuance tickets. As with labor rates discussed earlier, no markups are allowed on material issues, only actual costs supported with third party invoices. Material must be tracked to identify material issued to the reconnect project or return to inventory if previously issued and not used. Any material that is of low cost and used in high quantities, such as nuts and bolts, can be dif difficult for usage tracking. These material items are known as exempt materials. Exempt materials can be spread similar to an overhead based on material issue, percentage of materials used. A key point is that exempt materials must be spread equitably to all accounts where materials are utilized, not just the reconnect projects alone. RUS will finance those overheads that have a direct relationship with the construction of the reconnect project assets. This slide lists common overheads that RUS will finance. The overheads financed must be allocated fairly among the various accounts that benefit from the overheads. The overheads should be spread using a reasonable basis. For example, it would be reasonable to spread the employer's portion of the payroll taxes based on total labor dollars or labor hours. Vehicles would be spread based upon mileage. These spreads would be substantiated based upon source documentation that could include invoices, timesheets, mileage, log, mileage logs, et cetera. Finally, RUS will not finance overheads not listed on the previous slide without prior approval from RUS. Examples of overhead costs that would need prior approval would be engineering overheads and administrative overheads. The construction billings to the awardee from the affiliate should be supported by the cost items identified in the previous slides. 
This applies to matching grant and loan funded reconnect project costs. Furthermore, these costs to finance must also meet the cost principles in 2 CFR 200 subpart E and must be reasonable, eligible, and allocable. It is important to know that RU must, RUS must have access to supporting documentation from the affiliated party. If access is denied, then the affiliated party cost will be subject to disallowance. There are also requirements for records retention. The FOA award documents and construction pr procedures provide guidance on records retention as shown on the next two slides. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but want to caution you to keep all supporting records until after the project has been fully audited, approved and closed out by RUS. After that, there are certain timeframes that different records need to be kept as documented on these slides. Specifically, records related to plant and service must be retained until the facilities are permanently removed from utility service, all removal and restoration activities are completed, and all costs are retired from the accounting records unless accounting adjustments resulting from reclassification and original cost studies have been approved by our US or other regulatory body having jurisdiction. After reviewing your underlying records, we may disallow certain items. The award documents provide for our right to disallow certain costs and take other actions, as you can see on this slide. If disallowances are made, RUS will instruct you on how to satisfy the disallowance. It is up to RUS to decide on how the disallowance can be satisfied. Common remedies include depositing the funds back into the pledge deposit account to be used for other eligible purposes, reimbursing the federal government directly, or may even require suspending future advances. Finally, RUS may take any action it deems necessary to satisfy a disallowance. This is a key point. It is what RUS deems necessary and you may not agree with what RUS deems necessary. I also want to point out that RUS can still disallow funds even after the award is closed out if a subsequent review or audit discloses any deficiencies. Condition of award documents. The award documents have various conditions which you must follow. Certain conditions have to be completed before award closing as shown here. These items must be satisfied before RUS will execute the award documents. Other conditions have to be satisfied before RUS will make funds available as shown on this slide. And even more conditions must be satisfied before RUS will make individual advances as shown here. A couple of items that we see more often hold up requests to get advanced funds include missing or delinquent audited financial statements or not updating the reports and maps as required in the reporting and compliance system. This concludes my presentation on post-award financial compliance and now we'll open up for the question and answer session. Great, thank you, Ryan. This is Alexa, I'll be moderating your Q&A. Um, we have one question right now. Can reconnect awardees with multiple rounds of awards use the same pledge deposit bank account for all the awards? I don't know of any uh, reason that you, you could not. I don't think there's anything in regulation say, that states that you cannot use the same pledged account. I'll, I do have Chris Koberg here if he knows of a, has a difference of opinion on that. Hey Alexa, I can answer that. This is Farwa. Okay, go ahead. Yes, the, the same account can be used for multiple awards. Hey Alexa, this is this is Chris at Amcheck. I want to follow up on what Farwa um, indicated as well. 
Um, we can utilize, as everyone has said, the same PDA, but we do need a different DACA, a DACA executed that is associated with the specific award. So the same PDA can be used, but we do have to we do have to execute a new DACA for that specific award. All right, thank you for that clarification. Next question, how is sales tax accounted for? Materials were submitted through a 515 contract at cost without sales tax added. However, when we paid the vendor, we included the applicable sales tax, so the amount paid is higher than the cost in the contract. How is this to be accounted for when submitting these materials for reimbursement? Well, sales tax is uh, is a valid cost of, of, of uh, the materials that you purchase, so you are allowed to finance the, the uh, sales tax. And most likely it would be handled through, uh, it would be handled through the work order system because it's not actually on the, the 515 contract. Yep. All right, thank you. Next question, please discuss the requirements for prevailing wage versus the employee's no normal wage when the prevailing wage exceeds the employee's normal wage. I assume so, this is not considered a markup. It it is not the prevailing if the prevailing wage applies to your award, which for this round it does. Uh, your prevailing wage is considered to be the import the employee's wage for this reconnect project. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll give folks just a few more minutes to put in more questions. So Lisa Malloy had a question there, and I don't, I believe her answer might be correct, but I would, I would defer to Farwa because I don't know who all is using the DCS system still and who is using RNC only. Yeah, this is far well I can answer that um yeah. so if you are a reconnect awardee you are going to be entering all your financial reports along with other reports in the reporting and compliance system uh, RNC um if you were a telecom if you're a reconnect awardee who also had a telecom loan uh that was previously filing in DCS you will no longer need to file in DCS because uh, reporting in RNC will take care of the reporting requirements that you previously had, uh, you know, uh, to report in DCS. Right, and then this is Chris, but if you are an electric cooperative, you will have to do it in both locations. I do not believe that electric has been moved over to, far to RNC yet, and Farwa, correct me if I'm wrong on that. That is correct. Electric co-ops still have to report in DCS. Great, thank you, Farwa and Chris. Let's give it just a minute for folks to enter some more questions. James, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was going to circle back on to the sales tax question. Um, one way that would probably be handled is as part of the closeout requirements, the uh, awardee is required to obtain from the engineer an RUS form 756. And on the 756 form, it actually has a line at the top that shows the sales tax that's included in the final contract closeout. Great, thanks, James. Appreciate that. All 
Okay, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A, so we'll go ahead and wrap up this session a little bit early. Um, before I turn it over to Val, I just wanted to remind folks um, to attend tomorrow's session. If you haven't already registered for tomorrow, please go ahead and register so you can get that registration link specific to your um, to tomorrow's presentation. We will be covering different topics and I'll turn it over to Val to close us out and go over the agenda for tomorrow. Thanks, Alexa. And thank you so much for uh, joining us for day two of the Reconnect Post Award workshop on behalf of Rural Development U Rural Utilities Service and the Innovation Center. We just wanna thank you again for spending a large part of your day with us and we hope to see you back tomorrow where we will cover um, the following topics, uh, accounting, reporting and compliance portal demo. And um, we will have that demo and then we will go over reporting requirements and we will discuss project changes. So thanks so much and we will see you back here tomorrow.